Mikey. <laughs> What's up, Come man? Come on in, man. Nice to see you, dude. All right, nice nice to see you, buddy. Nice to see you. Yeah, I mean. Nice yeah. to see you, too, man. What's How up? you been? Dude, I've been good. How, how's living up here, man? Oh, it's been really nice. The quiet countryside. Awesome. Lots of space to dig. I mean, to, you know, expand. Incalculated silence, captivated by the violence I replay. Fifteen years ago today. There's no the devil's can't be a mini Steven Spielberg at like eight, but I can pick up a guitar. When I sing live, I'm, I'm screaming my ass off. Three o'clock in the morning. Dad. I think Jason's under my bed or something. <laughs> I want to be scared again. I'm most terrified. It's a little embarrassing. What's going on? I'm Mike Chaprari. I'm Spencer from Ice Nine Kills. And this is Loyal to the Craft. Cool. So yeah, this is Amazing, Other what is props. this? So this is uh, the bedpan from Scream 4, David Arquette awesome. gets uh, blasted in the face by Emma Roberts. Yeah. Right? And then this is uh, the lamp from Scream 4 when the girl is getting uh, disemboweled in the bedroom. Crazy. It's all really cheery stuff. <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. How do you come across stuff like this? Uh, like these two were actually a gift from my friend Nate, who's uh, really friendly with the prop master from the Scream franchise. Yeah, amazing. That's gotta be cool to like know that was in the movie. Yes. Like so inspirational for you, right? A hundred percent. And then Crazy. getting the knife was like the cherry on top. Yeah, when did that happen? Uh, it was about a year ago. It was the first thing I ever bought in a, a real live auction. Oh wow. And uh, I didn't think I was gonna win. I was kinda hoping maybe I don't wanna win with the, with the price tag. <laughs> but uh, lo and behold. I was the I was the guy who got it. That's so cool. Yeah, awesome. Where was the auction? Do you, do you go to that sort of stuff often, or was it for that night? No, it was like just a, a movie prop auction yeah. in general, and it was in California. I think the company has uh, offices in London too. Cool. And uh, when I saw that was on the on the list, so to speak, I was like, oh, nah, that's got to be mine. That's amazing. Yeah. So you just show up and go bid. Actually, it, technically, it wasn't live. It was all through online virtual. So you're just, oh, okay. you're clicking uh -oh. a button. Yeah. Bid, bid, I'm not gonna win, I just keep clicking. Yeah. Oh shit, <laughs> I won. That's amazing, they just ship it to you? Oh, uh, we had to, we picked it up. You don't that's wanna ship it. That's what I was gonna say, like that's a, you know, fragile uh, package right there. Fragile piece. So this is the rubber knife used in Scream 1. Crazy. There were only five knives used in part one, and I got this all from the prop master from the film. There was um, a real knife, a real knife that had been dulled, yep. a retractable knife that you see like stab Drew Barrymore in the beginning, and an aluminum cast knife, and then this rubber knife. So this can be seen throughout, um, you know, a majority of the film, yeah. including this shot when Ghostface has. Sydney on the ground wow. in the first attack of Miss Prescott. So crazy. Yeah. That sort of stuff, man, it's like an inspiration of, I feel like reminding you of the journey you're on and like yeah. how cool and it's like keep going and keep mm -hmm. uh, creating and, and going outside the box. And it's really cool to have something like that. I'm sure it's just not lost on you. I'm just like, that's so sick. I watched that when I was a kid. Like I that. got chills from you saying that and, and, and tying it back into like the persistence element, Wes Craven, who's right over here, yeah. he created Freddy Krueger, he directed Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. and he directed the first Scream. But before he was a huge, huge household name, he had this script for A Nightmare on Elm Street. And it was passed on by every single major studio. They said, no one is interested in movies about dreams. So he put it out wow. with this very small company at the time. And we all know what happened with yeah. Freddy Krueger. It became like one of the most iconic things yeah. in, in, in film history. history yeah. And that studio was New Line Cinema. And they went on to, to put out, you know, Lord of the Rings, like billion dollar yeah. uh, level franchise. So that was always something that was very inspiring to me. Yeah connected to, to Scream and Wes Craven. So cool. Those little reminders are really important. To have the perspective of tying all those things together, I think it's so cool. So you're gonna build a cool little yeah. shelf shrine. shrine. Yeah, yeah. That's so sick. 
So when I was a little kid, I was probably eight oh or nine, gosh, I went dude. to Spooky World, which was like the yeah. first theme park for horror, really. Yeah. yeah. And everyone who's in the haunt industry kind of recognizes Spooky World as like, that was that was it. Yeah. And uh, Kane Hodder, who played Jason in the most Friday the 13th any, any actor's been in, as Jason signed this, uh, so I guess that was like 30 years ago. Crazy. Still have it. And was that in your parents' like basement or something? Uh, right yeah, my old bedroom, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, so insane. much stuff like that too that I'm like, hold on to hold it. Hold on to it. My son's taking some of it now and being like, this is really special to me. I love it. It's so cool. Keeping stuff like that so inspiring. To Spencer. That's so Jason, sick. Jason, yeah. I, I, I've shown it to him because I've since become friends with him. Unreal. And he's like just blown away that I still have this. Seriously, yeah. so cool. This is from our music video, uh, oh the shower scene. Obviously, Edvard Munch, the scream, um, but we've put in our character yeah. sounds over it. So when I'm playing Norman Bates, I, I take this picture off to see uh, cool. the girl showering because I'm a big fucking creep. <laughs> hey, it's a character, guys. It's a <laughs> character. It's a character yeah. And they, I guess they only made like 10 of these things and I bought it from cool. a collector. Yeah. Pretty scary. So cool. <laughs> well, uh, to me, it's like, a, it's like an alarm system, you know? Like exactly, a, yeah, no one's coming in. No one's gonna burglarize it if they, <laughs> if they know the job's already taken. So oh, this wow. is uh, yeah. the original silence mask that's uh, screen used and you can see it in all of our videos from Welcome to Harwood. So cool. Who made that? This was made by uh, this very talented lady, Missy. She does a lot cool. of our special effects and stuff. Awesome. Really cool. Um, what was that like, finally getting on Fearless? It was wild, man. I'm, we were on a subsidiary of Fearless called Outer Loop. Yeah. And that was through our manager, Mike Mowry. Mike, that was yeah. his management company. And uh, I think when we got signed to that, the hope in the, at least in the contract, there was some wording that Fearless could, you know, upstream the yep. band. Yep. And, you know, so I always had it in the back of my mind that that might happen. But when we got the call that it was actually happening, it was, it was definitely like, wow, like yeah. a mic drop moment. Like, wow, we actually got a record deal. And, you know, like you said, Fearless was one of the, the marquee labels. Fearless, Drive Through, yeah. I was a huge fan of Epitaph, yeah. Victory. Um, so it, it was. It was again. It was that bucket list check off of of getting a, a record label, yeah. and that was so important to me from the beginning. You know, I have 100%. a book. I'll, I'll I'll get you a copy of it, and it's like it was like a little journal book where I would keep like a record of all the shows we played, which definitely has the Dudley one in it, yeah. and all the demos that we sent out over the years. Cool. And um, it's just like you know, it takes me back to my room when I was fourteen, fifteen, just like you know completely immersed in in the band and let's get signed we yeah gotta, we got to get signed we got to go tour totally you were uh obviously dedicated and the band was so dedicated and i remember putting those shows on you know we've talked about mm -hmm. this as we've seen each other throughout the years but putting that show on that was just what we did back then right there was yeah. no internet maybe we were chatting earlier like maybe pure volume right like how do you find like-minded musicians creatives in surrounding towns like how did we do all that right and like i feel like pre-internet and pre all that you have to be 100 percent dedicated and mm -hmm. you guys stayed over my dad's house that night and like <laughs> we were up all night just dreaming about making it whatever making it was at that point right we probably didn't even know record labels and stuff like that we were just like i just want to play shows absolutely and you have to in my opinion have there's got to be an element of that like journaling i'm big into like manifesting and all those types of mm -hmm. things but the fact that you did that obviously showed the passion but like you were creating that path for yourself i feel like to to do it right like do you have any looking in hindsight do you do you do you feel that way do you feel like you were kind of like creating your destiny or do you feel like you were just at the right place, right time to get an opportunity like signing to Fearless? I think for me and my parents can attest to it, I've always been relentless is how they put it. Like, yeah. you know, if I was a kid and I wanted to see Friday the 13th part four, you know, I wanted want them to rent it, I wouldn't shut the hell up until <laughs> they gave in. Yeah. You know, I wanted a paintball gun, I wouldn't shut up. Spencer, you're relentless. Yeah. So I think I just had that mentality 
and applied it to, to you know to when I found out that this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. And I, I just wasn't gonna stop until uh, till it happened. Amazing. I think you got to be a little bit fearless, <laughs> right? Yeah, no yeah. pun intended. Um, to to get into a business where it is such a a low success rate, just because there's so many people, and you can be, you know, there's so many talented bands, great songwriters that 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 never get the opportunity, just because maybe they didn't, they weren't playing the club that night, or the, yeah. or the demo didn't fall into you know Dr. Dre's hands when he signed Eminem or something yeah. like that. Um, so my whole mentality was just, you can't count on being lucky. You just got to put yourself out there so much to the point where it's everywhere that it possibly could be. And, yeah. and that increases the chance of, of someone seeing it and getting lucky. But is that really luck? I, th I think right. you kind of create your own luck. Yeah, yeah, 100%. What was that moment when you guys did sign to Fearless, that mic drop moment you said? Like what, what were the moments in the situations that just lined everything up where it was a yes from them? I think they were kind of blown away by how this song uh, called Me, Myself, and Hyde, the, the reaction of that song and how many, like, how many digital downloads the first yeah. week uh, was between The Predator Becomes the Prey, which was Outer Loop, Fearless, yep. and um, Every Trick in the Book. And we released this song that was the first time we ever did a track about like an existing property. You know, this yeah. is about a fantastic classic book. And it just, whatever reason, it resonated and people really liked it. I think it was one of the first times we had done a really theatrical kind of a, a song. It was it was very heavy, but it also had a distinct, like, Les Miserables, Phantom of the Opera influence. Yeah. So it was kind of unusual for the time. And, uh, yeah, it just... I guess it hit right, and and they thought it was a, a a good a good move for them to to bring us up to the you know the full fearless yeah. package. Amazing. What was the creative process behind creating that song? Like what, you know, everybody everybody that's in a creative mm -hmm. realm has a has a flow. You know that right. flow state of like getting into that creativity that you can hit a wall. That sucks. Right. right? Like how do you. How did you get into that space of like being like, I'm gonna push the boundaries and try to do something that might not have been done before and just go for it? What is that process for you? I think just leading up to that um, song, I think we, we had been too transfixed on like what everyone else was doing yeah. musically, aesthetically. I think we kind of fell victim to that. Like, oh, is this part heavy enough? Like, oh, this new Rise record sounds like, like this is, you yeah. know, this is what it should sound like. And I think as soon as we stopped caring about what was necessarily popular or cool at the time, I think that's when the creative juices just started flowing I mean, more naturally or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it was like it was a very it was a very natural, organic process. Cool. Like most songs that you know, I came up with a, a hook that I thought was good, and then brought in the other guys and, and the, the heavy sections became kind of like spastic and, and very, uh, almost like there were two voices at play. And, and, and I, when I heard that kind of sound, I was like, well, wouldn't it be cool to do it about Jekyll and Hyde so there could be kind of yeah. that back and forth. And uh, yeah. That's amazing. It's funny, like throughout that process, you know you want to create and do something, but you don't know what it is. And you yeah. go through that process and it happens. If you just let it happen organically and naturally, I feel like a lot of people, especially these days, right, in the social media world where people see stuff, and back in the day when we were putting out mm -hmm. music, you didn't know what that next drive-through band was gonna do until you saw them that summer on Warped Tour. Right. You didn't see the hype. You didn't, no one really showed a peek under the hood of like, this is what we're doing. Wait till you see, like that hype wasn't there. You waited all year till the Warp Tour or that mm -hmm. sampler CD came out. Yeah. And it comes out and you're like, oh my gosh, like they just did this. And it just blew all the drive through bands did that for me, where it was like, I should have done that. Like that's so cool. And like, how do I do that now? And you were, I always felt like I was behind the times on it. It was yeah. inspiring and motivating to continue to find my, you know, voice or create creative aspect that like I could bring to the table. You know, that whole process is just so interesting to me. And just trusting your gut and going for it. I think that's a huge testament to you guys. And just, again, back to the passion and being motivated and relentless. Like, I'm just gonna do this because it feels right to me. 
hoping obviously that it clicks, right? But if mm -hmm. it doesn't, you just keep doing it and maybe it will the next week or the next year. And that's the tough part of this industry right. that we're in. Patience. Because you, patience. And that is such a, it's not really like a learned trait. You can't teach patience. You can, you can talk about it, but yeah. actually being patient and being like, all right, well, another year down and like, you know, in the drum company for me, a lot of people are like, dude, FJC is just crushing it and this and that. And I'm like, yeah, the past couple of years sucked. And it was just fueled on passion, like me right. and five other people just doing it because we love it and I'm determined and I'm going to do it, you know? And you have good years, you have some things that happen that really refuel mm -hmm. you and all of that. It's ebbs and, and flows. flows, yeah. 100%. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head, passion. I mean, that's what takes you through the good times and, and the rough times yeah. in, in, in this business. Yeah. I'm so proud of you and what you've accomplished. Thank you, man. I mean, that... You know, we were talking about it off camera the first time we played with you guys and we stayed at, at your place in Dudley and you were you were showing us like a prototype, right? It must have been a prototype yeah. of an SJC kit. I'm like, man, this is cool. This is like, looks like like a cool cooler Orange County kit or something. Yeah. I was like, man, good luck with this stuff. And then a few years later, just seeing that you know, logo on like MTV where every drummer's yeah. playing, it was just like insane, man. Have you ever wondered who makes this stuff? We do. We're a full-service boutique ad agency located in Moorhead City, North Carolina. We are Triworks. We both, you know, a lot of our friends as well, Stevie Aiello and Monty, mm -hmm. and some of the some of the people, especially where we're from in Massachusetts, that New England scene, I think that there's something really special about the New England scene that we grew up in. I think so too. You know, and it's like the determination of just making that happen and being inspired by something. Yeah, I was inspired by West Coast drum companies. Right. You know, and I wanted to put my mark on it and it just worked. But even still, man, 23 years later, I'm like, is it working? I don't know. It's still just like the same <laughs> thing to me because I love it. And I just, right. I've never really done it there's no real end goal, you know, signing the fearless for you guys. That's just one of the things to do to create, continue creating. Mm -hmm. And for me, the same, like getting another band is awesome. You know, getting like a Trey Cole from Green Day was yeah, I mean, incredible for me, wow. you know, but still it's like, all right, cool. Like I got to just keep going and I don't know what is around the corner, but I want to find it, you know? And I think a lot of kids that I talk to that ask, I think a lot of people, even, even adults, they want like the, the magic pill that's just going right. to make it happen. And it's like, man, you have such a, we have such long lives. It's, and of course we don't want to show the, the dark times and the, 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 the hard times, but like they exist. Absolutely. There are days you wake up and like the exciting things aren't happening, right? I'm sure you get back from tour and you're just like, whoa, like it feels weird, right? What do I do now? Right. <laughs> right. Like how, Absolutely. Do, how does that feel? Like, and what is that process for you? Like between records or between tours? Do you get into a creative rut or do you, does it just continue going on? I'm a kind of guy in terms of like songwriting where I'm not the guy who's got like hundreds of songs yeah. written and I'm writing songs every day. I, when I finish a record, I, I put the, the pen down, so to yeah. speak. Um, you know, if something comes to me, a melody or something, yep. I'll attack it. But I, I, that's just my process with writing a record. Like yeah. Now it's time to write a record. I'm going to just go kind of full force and do yeah. it. Um, but I, I think it kind of it amplifies the pressure, which I think it can can help yep. in, in 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 certain people's situations. So when the pressure's on, it's time to write. Yeah. But um, off tour, I just try to, you know, obviously concentrate on on the the business aspect of the band and, you know, filming music videos and like mini movies and stuff like yeah. that. Um, but I like to to relax when I get back. And, yeah. Uh, love living in Los Angeles because it's the it's the mecca of of movies and that's so much part of my DNA. Hundred percent. Yeah, going to like movie premieres or horror movie activation stuff and and going to Burbank where they have like the Mystic Museum. And there's yeah. all this just really cool horror culture, movie culture, New Beverly Cinema uh, in West Hollywood at Tarantino's yeah. own theater and. The, the, the prints they're showing, it's all film, it's all from his personal collection. Crazy. So it's just like stuff that you don't, 
necessarily get everywhere. Yeah. So there's a lot to keep keep me distracted. Right, that's amazing. Were you always into horror films, or was that something that came later through the band? Like, which one would you say inspires or really kind of like turns the tide of the other? Are they the same for you? I think I really discovered horror and, and music around, like being super passionate about both around the same time. Cool. Uh, for me, bands like, you know, see Nirvana on MTV and Metallica, that made me want to play guitar, yeah. right? And then seeing Halloween around the same time, it all sort of came together. Like, these are my two things that I love. Yeah. And uh, being that young, I was like, you know, can't be a mini Sp Steven Spielberg at like eight, but I can pick up a guitar, you yeah. know? So that became what I decided I, I really wanted to pursue. Like I want to be a you know a musician. Yeah. And uh, many years into the band, those two passions just collided. Yeah. We did uh, the Silver Scream, and I was like, God, why haven't I been doing this the whole time? Yeah. Yeah. Because it was just uh, you know obviously it, it's what helped the band become far more successful that so that we could do it and, and survive but it was just so much more fun to do it you Amazing. know yeah creating and that's the thing too there's the passion there's the being relentless and then there's figuring out your why and your purpose mm -hmm. whether it's one thing or two things how do you combine them I think that's what so many people try to like find right and if you don't have it you don't have it like it just it doesn't you didn't create that on purpose right. you weren't like oh this is cool and that's cool it was just you were genuinely, you know, curious and passionate and loved it as a fan. And I think I feel so grateful in my later years of like, I'm so glad I found drums the way that I did because I, I was a drugs. Drugs. So <laughs> glad I found Santa. So, yeah, no, I wouldn't seriously. be, I probably wouldn't be here running the company yeah. if that was, if that right, was the right. case. But no, dude, like, you know, you find something in at whatever age. You don't have to be a kid. We were kids. And right. a lot of our peers, I think, we were lucky, and especially again that New England scene. There was a lot of, there was a lot of creativity happening, and there was a lot of people that were doing stuff that for me was motivating. I was mm -hmm. like, well, that dude's doing this, like I can too. Um, and finding that, and really just going in on that, and not going too broad. I find myself doing that sometimes, where I'm like, well, maybe drums isn't it. Maybe I should do this, 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 and all these other things. But I really figured out just be very narrow and deep with your passions, and just go all in on that. So that's incredible. It's been really cool to see you guys from afar, you know, and then reconnect that warp tour yeah, how many years so ago wild. that was, you know. And like that was probably the probably one of the first times we had seen each other yeah. in, in years, right? Yeah. And yeah. then we would just see each other at festivals and just like, "What's up, dude? Yeah, awesome to see you. Crushed Insane. it. Amazing." Like what 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 motivated you or rather how did you get into the world of going to premieres and like getting props and like obviously you know you can bid on them but you're in with some of these people right? yeah like how how cool is that for you to like be in that world that you've loved so much as it's, a fan it's it's wild man it, it's surreal uh doing things like horror conventions you know yeah. we have our we have our own horror convention now which yeah. is huge absolutely amazing uh, but back to like Massachusetts, like the first convention I ever attended was Rock and Shock, which was in yeah. Worcester at the Palladium and the DCU Center. And going going to that convention, uh, I think the first one maybe in 2005, I was like, oh my, you get to really meet these people that you admire yeah. from the films. It's like meeting your favorite band, right? Yeah. And things like Spooky World, if you remember from back 100%. in the day, yep. in, uh, Berlin, Mass., that was the first time I ever met someone from these movies, like Kane Hahn or from Jason, yeah. from Friday the 13th, and George P. Wilbur, who played Michael Myers. In fact, I have a the signed Jason mask that I got when I was like seven or something. That's amazing. We got to show that. Sick. And uh, yeah, that stuck with me, being able to interact, even just for a brief second, with these yeah. people you admire. And when the band started to really become horror-centric, they would start to put me at uh, at horror conventions, and I'm sitting here next to Kane Otter. I'm sitting here next yeah. to Bill Mosley and Skeet and Matt from Scream, and and, and signing autographs right alongside them, and uh, just having them be uh, very gracious and nice yeah. to me. And uh, it's just like you're here, you're sitting next to your heroes, and yeah. you're 
you're on the sort of the same side of the table with them. You know, I was the kid that was going to get autographs from these people. Yeah. And right. now people are, are, are lining up for, for ours. Unreal. And so I never, uh, it's never lost on me. Uh, that's why I, I, I really try to make sure that everyone that comes to the table feels like they really get um, a moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not just signing it, but it, it's, 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 it's interacting with someone that you uh, respect or, or inspired by. And I, I remember the people, most of the people I ever met in that, in that moment were always really cool to me. Yeah. So I want to give them that same experience because you know you forget in a few seconds, but that person will remember it for the the rest of their life. Totally. And if you meet one of your heroes in there, because they're people too, right? Like that's something that I've learned that when we were kids, meeting meeting a musician or somebody you thought was on that pedestal, it's like they're normal people too, and they might have a bad day and. You have to know that if you're in a situation like that, like meeting a fan, mm-hmm. you know, give them that that moment as, you know, whatever point in the day that you're at. It's like being grateful for it, I think, is really important. And I'm sure a lot of your fans or all of them appreciate you doing that because you realize it and you're humble and you're grateful to be at that position and be peers with these people that you grew up like meeting and, and, and being inspired by. I think that's so cool. I mean, we've talked about John Feldman, right? Yeah. Like we were both at that show in 2005. Like I legit emailed him right before that show. And yeah. just like, hey man, like I'm coming out. I'm a big fan. <clears throat> I would love to like, I don't know if it was like make drums for you guys or say what's up. Cause I was a fan of what he would do in producing. And he yeah. was like, yeah, dude, for sure. And it's cool finding those people and finding those opportunities of just get them, giving them a high five and like having those few moments of like talking. But when you can become friends with them and you know, collaborate and just have a friendship and mentorship almost of like, I think that's cool. And it's really important, especially as, you know, our, our generation is getting older and stuff. I think the younger kids that are looking up to you in the band, I think it's important to give them those elements of not necessarily how you were successful, but just what we're talking about now, like just have passion and just be patient and just keep hustling. Cause I think a lot of the world that we're in is, you know, you said it, it's not, always cutthroat, but it's like, there's a lot of really talented and motivated people out there that just don't get a shot. Um, so giving, giving for me, especially the next generation, like that hope of like, you can do it, like keep, keep pushing, I think is super important. That's awesome that you've gotten those opportunities to like sit by these people that like you've seen in the movies and stuff. That's such a different world that I can't even imagine. Yeah, man, it, it, it is not lost on me. So that, cool. that, um, that I, I get to, to do that stuff. And I always, I always try to tell them, you know, I don't, you know, do it too much because then it becomes a little bit yeah. fanboy-like, but right. you know, that's at the end of the day, you know. Yeah. I'm a fan of, of these people and, uh, you know, they inspired me to do what 100%. I do today. So I like them to know that. Yeah, when you started doing the music videos, and you know, correlating to the new style of music that you guys had that worked, were you always, were you producing? Were you like very heavily involved or did you guys bring in a team? What was that process like for you? So basically I would come up with the general concept of the overarching story for each album. Uh, oftentimes, you know, having writing collaborator partners. Uh, yeah. This guy, Andrew uh, Smith, who who I've known since I was in like kindergarten. Yeah. Who's been a great friend. He, he collaborates with me on cool. a lot of the ideas. So it's fun yeah. going back to that same era when we met to use the same friends uh, yeah. to make these things. And then just taking it to uh, different production teams on the first record. We work with um, a production team out of Massachusetts who were fantastic, uh, Dan Horhan and his whole crew. And, uh, you know, doing certain videos where like, you know, where this is about Friday the 13th and we're filming at an abandoned summer camp yeah. in, somewhere in Massachusetts in the, in yeah. the outskirts. Um, that was surreal in and of itself to be, we're really, you know, making a movie here. Seriously. And then on Welcome to Horrorwood, we, you know, we'd all moved out to LA um, and, and used a different production company. Uh, this guy Jensen, who's uh, this awesome, awesome guy from the Ukraine, who just has a, a great visual aesthetic and style that I loved. And we were actually both fans of each other's work. I had cool. known some of the videos he had done and he had liked the band. And we kind of almost reached out around the same time. And he'd, he'd just been able to bring our vision 
to life cool. in a really cool and fun way. And getting to have the act, some of these actors that I've admired over the years in, you know, integrating them into the story. Yeah. You know, Bill Mosley, who's was in everything from Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 to all the Rob Zombie movies. Like yeah. he, he plays uh, Captain Harris, you know, he's a police yeah. officer. So yeah. I thought, oh, that's cool. Let's give him so an right. opportunity to play against type because he's usually the, the criminal. Yeah. Um, you know, things like that. It's that's just been so crazy. Cool. When you started filming those music videos and obviously the, you're the singer, so you're the main person, you know, in the, in the music video, were you having to get in a different mindset and a headspace or were you just so stoked to be able to do that, that it was just like- To act. Go. To act, yeah. That's, uh, that's yeah, crazy. you know, I've never really been an actor, but I, I was always the kid memorizing all of the lines for all the movies, yeah. so I could definitely memorize dialogue. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I tried to do as best as I could. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was surrounded by so many people who were great actors that you kind of pick up things from them and they would they would often give me advice because they know you know I'm a musician I'm not yeah I'm not a thespian <laughs> yeah that's crazy dude what's been your favorite memory so far on this journey like the most you know epic thing that you've done so far that you just didn't think would happen uh, there's so many uh, from the horror world as I said integrating those people that I love into yeah. our into our world um, and getting compliments and praise from those people yeah. like when we did the silver scream con uh in massachusetts you know we'll be playing a song about scream and i'll look and you know the the star of the movies right there jamming mm -hmm. out and stars of other movies were playing about friday 13th or these other other films and you'd see the actors there in real time yeah. and their reaction but um i would say one of the the most amazing moments um, which translated into two years, will be two years of touring, was getting the call uh, to play with Metallica. Yeah. I mean, that is just like absolutely insane to yeah. me. Crazy. Saw them play at, I guess it was probably the Fleet Center back then, which, you know, yeah. TD Bank Garden now in Boston in yeah. 97. My dad took wow. me to the concert. I think it was Load or Reload they were promoting. Dude, you were like 10, 12? 10, 11. Yeah. Uh, and I just remember that concert so vividly, like I, like I was, like it was last week, you know, yeah. I could picture how it all went down and how Lars came out and, you know, they stopped the show cause they, you, they said that there was like, um, some sort of, someone got hurt, but it was like part of the act. Like, okay, like yeah. they had a crew guy fall down, but he was tangled in, in wires. It was all part of the act. <laughs> yeah. But, uh. I had already loved Metallica, and they were one of the reasons why I wanted to play guitar and learn, you know, Master yeah. Puppets and Battery and stuff, and uh, always held them to the highest standard um, of my favorite bands. And, uh, you know, we got a call from our booking agent, Eric, and he was like, do you want to play uh, in Vegas uh, at Allegiant Stadium? I was like, what? Yeah, Metallica wants you to open for them wow. and Greta Van Fleet. I was like, what? That's yeah, let me sick. clear, let me think. Let me look yeah. at my schedule. Yeah. So we did that show and it was incredible. And then uh, I think a few weeks later, they asked us to do two more with them in Pittsburgh uh, where the Pirates play and yeah. um, in Buffalo where the, uh, the Bills play. Insane. So, I mean, if it all ended there, it would be insane, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I don't know. A few months after that, we just do more. Want to? Do you want to be on the full like world tour, playing at, like playing every single city? Yeah. I think we're the only band that's on every single city. Crazy. And I was, I was like, this is absolutely insane. This is the yeah. biggest metal band of all time. One of my favorite bands. A, a band that helped shape our sound. Like when we were recording Welcome to Harwood, there were definite, definitely moments where it's like, I want this acoustic guitar to kind of sound like the battery intro, or yeah. I want this breakdown at the end to feel like the the, the one breakdown. Yeah. You know, because that's like, for so many people like me, that that was the first time they ever heard Double Kick, or at least I could remember, sure. right? Yeah. And uh, to go out on the road and, and, and just be given that opportunity to, to even just be on the fly, the, the flyer. Yeah. I mean, it's just... It's surreal, I'm sure. It's surreal, and it's just putting so many more eyes on us. And, I, and they're yeah. such nice guys. 
They treat the bands they tour so well. Um, they come into our dressing room and say what's up to us. Cool. Uh, I mean, they're just really nice guys, and I can't thank them and their whole team yeah. enough. That's amazing. I remember seeing that and I'm just being like, what? insane, dude. Like, that sort of stuff, it can happen, right? I think, yeah. I think on two sides, I was like, stoked for you guys, but also like, good for you dudes. Like, obviously, we've known each other for a while, making Patrick drums and stuff like that. Yeah. But just as a fan of music, it's like, that stuff can happen. Like, these dudes are from small towns, right. just like everybody else, you know, we're all, we're all just hustling and working and to see that opportunity, it was really cool. And for you guys, I'm sure, I love talking to bands and, you know, my buddies that tour and find out about their heroes that they've been able to either play with or meet and knowing that they're cool is like passing the torch, so to speak, and like teaching like, hey man, you guys take bands out on the road. Right. You know, it's great to hear that they're nice and not standoffish and things like that. No. Where like, you know, it just teaches the next generation of musicians and now you're carrying part of that torch to a degree where it's like the bands you guys take out, I'm sure you're going a little bit more above and beyond to make them feel feel welcome, you know, and just, I think that's really cool and the camaraderie that's behind the scenes here to boost everybody up, I think that's awesome where it's not, there's a lot of gatekeepers, you know, yep. in various industries and various businesses and I think whenever I hear stories like that, I'm like, that's really cool because it would be very easy for them to be completely the opposite. Right, and right. And just be like, we're gonna bring out the same bands that we always have or, you know, nobody but to bring out a young band that's hustling and give them that opportunity is really cool to see and it's inspiring you know absolutely man they they have been so kind to us and, and like you said it inspires me to to get out of my comfort zone we take bands out and, yeah. and not just hang on the bus although you know i'm a singer so i'm always trying to rest my voice you know yeah. precious singer um <laughs> but i think that they back to what you said i think they learned from when Ozzy took them out, and Ozzy yeah. was really cool to them, yeah. and, and when Metallica took out Korn, and Metallica was really cool to Korn, and I hear great things about that band when they take bands yeah. out. It's just like, it's passing the torch and and and, and showing us the way. Showing you know? the way, yeah. 100%, dude, that's so rad. Like you said, they don't need to take anyone out towards Metallica. They yeah. can fill the stadium yeah. 10 times over by themselves, but yeah. they want to do that. Uh, they They want to help out the next crop of of metal and yeah. rock bands. The ebbs and flows we talked about earlier is so weird for me to think about because they are. The peaks and valleys of being a creative is um, they are they are big, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, knowing that there are people like that and kind of back to Feldman, like John yeah. would always be somebody for me that I would either see what he was doing, a new band he was producing, or just the sound he was creating all the way down to just exchanging a text message with him or stopping into his studio or seeing him at Nam or something. Yeah. And giving me the time and giving me the knucks and just a pat on the back. It was like, cool, man, like that for me really helps. You know, th mm -hmm. those moments of like, am I, you're, I'm unsure of myself sometimes. Like, should I be doing this? Is this the right way? And the people that are ahead of you doing it, that have already been there, done that in a certain situation, it's like, you're still here too and you're hustling and I appreciate, you know, the, just the look, you know, the fact that you're giving me the time of day is really cool. Um, and I think more people, especially in our world should do that. You know, the, the gatekeeper thing. Um, I think more bands and more musicians, especially to the next generation, um, being open to that, just like, Hey, here's some advice. Here's, you know, a way to kind of keep your fire burning because it is hard. You know, the, when you're in a low spot, you need somebody to kind of like pick you up, your bandmates or whatever it mm -hmm. may be, the, your, your peers or a hero of yours, you know? And putting yourself in that situation through that relentless um, attitude, I think is certainly a way for the next generation of kids to do that, you know, just not giving up. Yeah, yeah that kind of stuff goes a long way. I remember when, I remember the guitars from, um, the band escapes me, but Anytime, anytime a musician that I admired would give me the time of day, whether it was at a show or just saying, hey, you know, here's some advice about this demo, it, uh, it really does make an impact. Yeah. So I think it's, it's important when you get to a certain place where, where people are looking up to your music or whatever you're creating to, uh, to return the favor. Because yeah. you needed it back then. It would have been nice to have yeah. someone do that. Yeah. And yeah, Feldman has, has always been... A hero of ours. I mean, Goldfinger. I started the band after a Goldfinger concert. Crazy. At, in, at the Worcester Palladium. Dude, it's crazy. Like the Palladium holds so many memories for me. I remember seeing like Rufio, and they were on tour with Newfound Glory, mm -hmm. and like just seeing those bands. It created such a 
uh, it burned in my memory of like just Rufio, West Coast, Nitro Love Records, Rufio. you know, Newfound Glory, Florida, <laughs> Drive Through Records. Like, yeah. it just, you, you, and that still happens. There's a lot more, I think, of it. Social mm-hmm. media and the internet has obviously made the landscape much different, as we both know, because we're part of it still. Um, but even then, it was it was uh, it was harder to find the bands. It's I think a little bit easier now, but it's the same method. It's the same way of being inspired and either asking for help or trying to you know network or create a relationship with somebody or giving that you know time or two cents. I think that's really important. And good on you guys for doing it. You've always been to me really accessible as a band. Um, you know, the things that you guys create motivate so many kids. Just the stuff that you guys have done with the book and the, the Silver Scream stuff, like seeing the kids that go out there. It's really cool to hear your story about, you know, the passion of like, I want to make sure that everybody that comes, they're there for a reason. I want to give them a good time and make sure that they know that I'm grateful for them. I think that's important. A hundred percent, man. I, and I think that I've al- always tried to approach things from being a fan myself of, of, of films and of, of bands and what I would want to see from my favorite artists yeah. or from my favorite film franchises. Yeah. And, that, and that's how I approach it. Heck yeah. Are there any bands, people, actors, actresses, producers that you want to work with that's on your list of like, I got to, I got to do that, <laughs> you know, that you feel like would be the, the, the next moment that you're, that you're trying to go after? I think because we're from Massachusetts and, and Rob Zombie is as well and kind of came up through the same world of of heavy metal and horror, yeah. I think that that would be just such a, a cool that would be sick. match. And I love his films and I've always liked his music. I've yeah. got a white zombie shirt. Heck yeah. That uh, I got, again, like I got probably when I was like eight. Yeah. And uh, it fits me now. Like there's <laughs> yeah. a picture of me in it I'll try to find when I was like, eight or nine and it's down to my knees yeah that's awesome and i I wear it now and it it fits amazing dude thank you so much for letting us come here and hang and sharing your yeah absolutely man it's a it's a pleasure to have you here man it's been so cool to see you guys just do this you know like um with the drum company making art i always i always wanted to make drums you know because i was like i'm a drummer i want to make my own custom drums again inspired by west coast drum companies and Mm -hmm. things like that but creating stuff like we did you know he walked by me at the warp tour booth and you're like we need a popcorn kit and i was like <laughs> yeah dude like i saw it in my head and like to be able to have the idea and craft it and and, and make it happen i think there's something so special about that collaborative process that i was always and still am so drawn to it could be drums it just so happened to be drums whether it was drums or guitars or whatever else like I just have always wanted to create something and so to collaborate with people like you guys has been awesome and Patrick obviously is such a great drummer and a great dude um, playing those drums I was like dude they're gonna be hard to play because like you were like I want the, the top to be like a popcorn bucket like a vintage thing and I'm like we can make it like really 3d and contour cut and everybody was like yeah let's do it and I was like Patrick you gotta he's like I'll figure it out tilted the drums more and he, he had to change the way he played drums to make that happen. To but. fit in between the popcorn. That's got to be a yeah. first in drumming history. A hundred percent, dude. And I what love What influenced that. you the most in your drumming? Well, popcorn, really. Popcorn, really, yeah. But, but good on you guys because I, I think it comes back to what we were saying earlier. It's like you've been able to turn your passion into your into your business, into your life. And that's yeah. it's something that... Uh, so many people want to do and that's yeah. inspiring. Thank you, man. So. And I, I, dude, I, seriously, I, I think back to a lot of memories and again especially as I get older and like my kid is growing up and I'm like holy crap like this dude is he likes drums he comes to shows with me he like he tells me what's what drums he thinks are cool and what bands (laughs) he thinks are cool and it's like gosh like I think so much recently about my early years and like Mm -hmm. literally dude like sitting in my parents house that night we were just talking about like making it in the music industry and what that might look like it might feel like you remember that yeah palpable feeling of like i want that so bad and like we're both here hustling and doing it still you know like 20 something years later it's amen really cool amen so thank you for sharing your dude, story of course with me, man, man. always a pleasure over. appreciate it yeah you know, uh meet and greet oh yeah dude that one i got chills watching that. thanks Seriously. man well nadia my girlfriend she's she plays clarice in it cool so it's dude. again back to the rob zombie thing he always puts his does this stuff ever scare you cool. no i wish it did <laughs> Like, when so you were a kid, like, this when I was, ki- I was a kid, I'm always chasing that. Like, 
I want to be scared again. Yeah. You know? Okay. Does that play a part into what you're doing of like trying to create that element in your music? I, I, I think maybe subconsciously. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we try to do like jump scares with our music sometimes. Yeah. So what was that feeling? Do you remember the feeling when you were a kid of like actually being scared? Yeah. What I, rem was? I just remember like watching those movies and my parents are like, all right, well, if we let you watch it, we're not going to hear you screaming from us for us in the middle of the night yeah like, no <laughs> and then three o'clock in the morning dad yeah dude i think jason's under my bed or something so it did it like actually scared and he was me. never there he was never yeah. under the bed oh bummer i know <laughs> i know i'm most terrified it's a little embarrassing cilantro i hate cilantro it really? is the, it is like it hijacks every meal <laughs> It's just not even on a good taco though. I I can't do. I spit it out. I love Mexican food too, so it's very difficult. I would, yeah. But you know, when I came to LA, it's like they put it on coffee pretty much. <laughs> they put it on everything. Nice. Well, some people say it tastes like soap, like genetically, but yeah. I like the taste of soap. <laughs> <laughs> Is, is this another one back to the parents? Yeah, soap in yeah, the they put soap in my, you know. 